So, you guys, we've been talking about group, right? It's the last week's group. So, I'm going to share some of my groups. I've heard my testimony, it's kind of recurring. Um, but, enjoying this, a lot of the adults in the room might know about a funny bald guy, Dave Ramsey. Some kids might know him, you're like, what? Who's this guy? So, he talks a lot about money and debt, and parents might have thought of him in his university or how do you do like a student version. But what stuck out to me from Financial Peace with Dave Ramsey was this idea of a land that women have. It's called a security land. It's this idea that when you're feeling insecure, you have this gland that freaks out. And you're like, oh no, we don't have no money, and you're freaking out. So that's the idea of the security gland. And when I heard this, I was like, crazy, like that's me. Like, I freak out with any sense of insecurity. But I learned two things since learning about this that are true about the security gland. The first is that it's not always about money. Like anytime I feel like Insecure in a relationship, insecure in my body image, insecure in activities, money for sure, but any day that I feel like any of these issues are happening and my plan for my life isn't going along well swimmingly, I'm going to freak out. <laughs> so it's not just about money, but the longer that these things continue, the further along we have to get the sorrow and anxiety I get. So these are really big issues that they seem like, oh, one thing, it's not that big of a deal, but all compounded they are. So the other thing I like is the security plan isn't just for girls. We heard from some of the guy leaders about their group and anxieties, and it's really common for guys to feel like they have to provide for their families, or that you have to be strong and like this image of like what a guy is, and so they have insecurities too. Um, but these are just more senses of security that add to the list that results in our anxieties, and anxiety gives Satan a foothold in our lives. So when we get to these insecure places, Satan will twist up our lives until we can hardly see God anymore. And we fall into believing that we might be able to control our own lives if we just have hard enough. So, I didn't really have a security gland, and it's been a big player in my faith journey, so I told you about it. So, picture this little gland and be like freaking out, like, gotta take control, gotta take control, gotta stop, Parker! But, <laughs> Um, my journey is and continues to be about giving up control, letting God take control of my life. So it's in sixth grade. Who's in sixth grade here? Plenty of you. So sixth grade, in sixth grade, I learned about Jesus and knew that God is good and like understood that He has good plans for me. But I'm still struggling, be it through relationships, school, tragedies. I'm still struggling to truly give God the reins in my life and trust Him to take control of things. Um, so. I've been in multiple relationships. It sounds funny saying this because you know I'm married now. But <laughs> I've been in multiple relationships when the guy I was dating wasn't really into me or didn't really want what I wanted from the relationship, but I was like taking home to get things out. So the worst of these was a guy named Kellen that I met my second year of college, and I liked Kellen, this guy, before I even knew him. When I say I fell for him, I was like face down, mud all over my face, like I have fallen. And it's like a two week period, like, how do I even know you? Um, so I worked my way into his life until he was like forced to like me. You know, like anywhere he goes, okay, like there I am, like I'm gonna be like hanging out, I'm gonna be by the desk, wherever he is. So eventually I'm in this relationship and you can take the air quotes to me in that no one you remember dating. He wouldn't admit we were dating, and he wasn't treating me with the dignity that I would have craved and like said was required to be in whatever sort of relationship. Uh, God periodically brought to my attention through friends, sermons, events that this wasn't a good place to be. Um, but I'm stubborn, <laughs> and I don't need to control my life, and I had picked him, so I'm in control. Um, so even my attempts to like distance myself from him would gain slightly more affection. Um, so on for a whole school year. So well, you know, like there's a long time. <laughs> he graduated. We saw each other over the summer while I was actually interning here in Ohio. And he's in Michigan, so like a lot of effort to see seeing each other. Um, and we still weren't actually dating. No one would admit it, but we were. Uh, and then the next school year starts, he's like a big adult man, and I'm still in college. Um, but he planned this trip to go climbing in Colorado. 
pretty cool trip, but it's okay. My other friends from Alabama are going in, like, walking out. But at this point, we've been exchanging phone calls, and I realized I really love <coughs> this guy, like, the L word. And so, I'm like freaking out. I have all this pent up emotion, and I knew I had to say something because I wasn't going to see him for a while, right? So I went on this trip to meet him in Colorado with all of the pent up emotions, and it ended miserably with me falling on the side of an actual mountain. Um, needless to say, he didn't return the feelings I had for it. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit did some work in me, giving me the guts to start fresh. I wiped the sink clean, and when we got back from this trip, I deleted Helen from Snapchat, killing our over 260 day snap streak. Some of you know that's probably the worst part of this story, because you don't even care about Snapchat anymore. But at the time, Snapchat was like a cool story. So can you commit it to 300 days? It's been so cool. It was like a really big deal. But I ignored all other communication from him, all the thoughts on text, all those things. And God worked on my heart and showed me it was my worth that him, capital H, that mattered, not my lack of worth from heaven. God showed me how I to be one and something that I was fully in my regard and God. Um, I identified with two passages in scripture during this time of my life uh, that I can share with you. So this one is actually in the three of the Gospels, but I can read from Matthew 26. Meanwhile, Jesus was at Bethany at the house of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, What a waste! That could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of what they were thinking, replied, Why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. She's Pour this perfume on me to prepare my body for it. I tell you the truth, whenever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's name will be remembered in discussed. So what this is getting at is this was a costly act. Like she had this expensive perfume that she poured out in an act of worship, and it expressed her deep devotion to Jesus. Flipping over to Luke, so we have a super similar story. So that's why I'm telling you both, because I don't really remember which one was the one I heard in this sermon that stuck out, but both are getting at the same topic. But this one's slightly different, so listen for the difference. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfumes. Then she knelt behind him at his feet and he came. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. She kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Skip a little. And Jesus says, When I entered your home, you didn't offer me the water to wash the dust from my feet, but she's wiped them with her tears, or washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of all oil to anoint my head, but she's anointed my feet with a great perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Jesus said to the woman, So think about the humility this time. She's like touching Jesus' feet. I hate me. <laughs> so this always like stands up to me and it's like, oh man, she was like wiping her beautiful hair on his feet and like kissing his feet. Um, but so the reason she asked about this is because it's not to earn the forgiveness. She does it out of love. Like her sins were forgiven and she experienced the peace of God, so she wanted to show this love. And she did it in response to already having the I identify with this character, these two women, that gave up something of such great value, and it was in exchange for closeness with Jesus. I identify having to fight off the voices and saying, why give up such a valuable thing? Like, maybe it'll be worth it in the end, just stick around. Um, and I bet people in her life that didn't know Jesus were saying things like, what you're doing isn't so bad, or was it really worth it now when it's hard? I'm here to tell you today, whatever you think is more valuable, then your relationship with Jesus just plain isn't. Giving God control of your life, and not just your Wednesdays or your Sundays, giving Him control of the most important aspects of your life, your grades, 
sports teams, reputation, relationships, whatever it is that matters to you, that's what's like. So guess what happened to me a few near four months after that four day on the mountain? I don't know my first date with that guy. You know where he was the whole time? Some of you know this story. Yeah, I know. The whole time, he was there. He was Calvin's roommate, and God was in control, obviously. <laughs> because Sam got to know me, the real me, not this controlling me, not this fake me that was covered up. And God's brought me a long way into adulthood realizing this thing about trying to control my life and make my own plans, be what works. But I'm still always seeing more aspects of my life that I need to pass control to get the board than as an adult. I think it's a never ending process because as long as we're on this earth, we're going to find things that entertain us or please us or distract us, pulling us away from God. So we often say, give it to God. Like that can be like this whole thing that's like, oh, give it to God. But like, how often do we actually think about what that means? We just say it. Like, yeah, that's an easy thing to say. For me, it meant not trying to force a relationship that wasn't meant to be, giving up something very important to me, and the consequent nights of sobbing, efforts of avoidance, and leaning to the strength offered to me by the Spirit when I was at my weakest. So, you have your own stories, and it'll look very different. Everyone's going to, but you don't have to read up on a seven steps to give it to God article on BuzzFeed or whatever rules you want to follow. It's not about that. You just start by asking God to show you where you've taken control of your own life and what you hold in higher regard than Him. Once you know what He's asking of you to give up, it's going to take courage, a leap of faith, or a moment on your own.